Good to be back with you here on Sabbath. It's been a while since I've been here because we had the It Is Written meetings, three Sabbaths down at Butria. Then the last two Sabbaths I've been there. So it's been like six weeks since I've been with you on Sabbath here. It's good to be back with you. We had quite a series of meetings, and so I appreciate what you guys did to volunteer and help with those meetings, supporting them, praying for them. It was a wonderful thing, and the work is not finished yet. We have still much to do to contact those who are still interested in studying the Bible, who made decisions to follow Jesus, who want to get baptized in the future. So continue to pray and uh, be part of the process of continuing to reach out to the community. It's not just big sets of meetings and then shoo, now we rest. We have to keep work, keep on working for more and more people to know Jesus and be ready for his soon return. So this morning I have a message called The Last Enemy. And before we get into this message, I want us to pray one more time together. Father in heaven, thank you for blessing us already this Sabbath. As we open your word, as we consider what Holy Scripture says, please impress our hearts and our minds. Help us to receive your word, your truth today. Speak to us, Lord. Speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Levi was a 16-year-old boy. Any 16-year-olds out there? Oh, I know you're not 16. Ashraf is 16. Okay, thanks, Ashraf. You, you wish. You wish. <laughs> Levi was 16 years old. He had just got his driver's license. In America, the age to get your driver's license in most places is 16, at least where I come from in the Midwest. 16 years old, you get your driver's license. You can start driving without any adult supervision, any adult with you, okay? When I turned 16, I got my driver's license driving everywhere. Levi got his license. He was driving everywhere. He was full of life, full of energy, full of promise for the future. Look at his picture there. Young, bright man, young man. But one Saturday night, he went with his friends to a party. You guys like to go to parties too, right? Good parties, of course where there's not anything bad happening, social gatherings, we like to be with friends, we like to hang out, we like to do stuff together. He went to a party one Saturday night. But unfortunately, at this party, there was bad things happening, including alcohol being served and drunk even by children, 16 years old, who are under the age, the legal age, to drink alcohol in the United States. And so, the report that came to us, the family, was while Levi was there, he didn't drink. He didn't drink. And Levi's parents had a curfew for him. They told him, look, fine, you go to the party, but you got to be home by a certain time. And if you're not home by a certain time, there's big trouble. Maybe some of you parents have these same kind of rules for your kids. Curfew, got to be home on time. So Levi, since he had his license, he had a car, he drove some of his friends home. He had two friends with him. Drove one home, dropped him off. Successfully, safely, no problem. Got to rush the other friend to his house, drop him off, and then get to his own home to beat curfew. And that's where things went bad. Apparently, young Levi was driving very, very fast. And he went through a stop light, and there was some construction on this little small highway road in small town Nebraska. Not like a big city like this, like the villages in Lebanon, where there's not very many people at all. Construction there, he's going too fast, goes through a light. Somehow, he goes off the road, into the ditch. The car rolls. He and his friend fly out of the car, they get thrown out of the car, and they die instantly on the scene. 
Levi was my step cousin. A cousin. I had known him, I'd known his brother, we had played, we'd known them for many years. And now his life is snuffed out. Just like that. No warning. His mom and dad, as you can imagine, were totally devastated. Totally devastated. His older brother was shocked. They were like best buddies. They loved each other so much. His brother was in so much pain. And I remember that Katie and I attended the funeral. And since these two guys were high school students, the whole high school was in shock and so sad about losing these two students of theirs. They're classmates. So the whole high school practically showed up for the funeral. In the high school gym, I think it was. Full of people. And it was so sad. I remember crying that day and many others crying that day. I was upset. It was an upsetting experience because death had stolen the life of one so young. Death is not part of God's original plan. He never intended for us to die. He wanted us to live forever without dying. Death is a result of sin. It is an enemy. Death robs us of those we love. It breaks our hearts and crushes our spirits. Death is a subject that presents tough questions. Like, why did God allow a 16-year-old boy and his buddy to die like that? So young. Before they could experience life. They couldn't graduate from high school or college. They never got a chance to get married or have children or have a career. They didn't get to experience much of life. Why? Well, when death of a loved one overwhelms us, which maybe you've experienced this, maybe you've lost a loved one recently or maybe even a long time ago, it can be overwhelming at that moment. But it's comforting to remember that the Bible tells us that God has the keys of death. God has power to raise the dead. And I want you to open your Bibles with me this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's going to be our main place of study this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I want us to start in verse 12. First Corinthians 15, verse 12, and down to verse 14 to start. Here's what Paul writes. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is is also empty. Uh, this is the start of a very interesting argument that Paul is making. He's saying right off the bat, some people don't believe in the resurrection. Okay, that's still true today, right? Not everybody in this world believes in the resurrection or in a, the ability for the dead to come back to life. Some people don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead after he died, three days later. They don't believe that. Some people don't. But Paul is saying, look, if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty. Why should pastors stand before congregations and preach week after week after week if Christ is dead and in the tomb? Why? What was the point of that? Why are we at church at all if Christ is still dead? If he did not rise from the dead? Paul continues in verse 15. He says, yes, and we are found false witnesses of God. 
Because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. Wow, he's repeating this argument. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Follow Paul's logic, okay? If the dead do not rise, then Christ could not have risen. And if Christ did not rise, our faith is futile. It's meaningless. We're wasting our time, Paul says, if Christ didn't rise from the dead. And he's pretty much repeating his argument, almost word for word here. Why is he repeating himself? Because without the resurrection of the dead, Christ isn't risen and our faith is futile. In other words, we would all be lost. No eternal life. No forgiveness of sins. Without the resurrection of Christ. He continues verse 18. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. If Christ hasn't risen from the dead, Paul says, then the great people of the Bible would never rise again. Think of the great people in the Bible that you might hope to meet someday in heaven after Jesus comes and resurrects the dead. Maybe someone like Abraham. Anybody want to meet Abraham someday? Well, I want to talk to that guy. He's got some amazing stories that I've read. I want to talk to him. What about Noah, Joseph, Elisha, David, Esther, Ruth, Daniel, John, Peter. All of these guys in the Bible who have died in Christ, Paul says, would have perished, gone forever. Hollis, no more, finished. They would be eternally asleep, never to rise again. Without the resurrection of the dead, our religion, Christianity, is wiped out. If there is no hope for eternal life with Christ, if we don't have that hope for the future, we are to be pitied, Paul says, more than anybody else. If there's no resurrection, then Jesus himself was an, was an imposter. Because he said he would rise after three days. So was Jesus a liar? If there is no resurrection, then baptism, which typifies or symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, baptism would lose its significance. What's the purpose of baptism if Jesus didn't rise from the dead? Paul paints a hopeless scene. He's making this argument. Without the resurrection of the dead, Jesus is still in the grave, and thus we are all lost without a prayer and without a hope. Let's read verse 20. But, Paul says, but... Now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Thank God, praise God for that verse. Because the other verses were quite depressing. Because there's no hope. But, Paul says, there is hope because Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus has conquered the grave. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He's alive today. He is not in the tomb anymore. Notice verse 21 to 23. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now he's starting to make his argument for the resurrection. For as in Adam all die, even so Christ in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, 
afterward those who are Christ's when? You got it in your Bible? At his coming. Yeah. First Christ, the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, at the second coming. Notice what Paul describes as these different resurrections. Jesus first. Then later on, resurrection at the second coming of Jesus. But we also know, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27, that after Jesus died and rose from the grave, many people rose from the grave with him and went into Jerusalem. Now, who those people were, we don't know exactly. But the Bible says this happened. So there was Jesus raised, there was other patriarchs, prophets, maybe who were raised to life, at that moment, and then there are those who are risen at the second coming of Jesus. Please catch that detail. The resurrection of the righteous will take place at the second coming. Not before, not the instant they die. No, 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 no. The Bible says the dead know nothing. Remember Pastor Bradshaw talked about that in his meetings last month. The dead know nothing. The Bible says the dead are sleeping. Jesus said the little girl was sleeping. He said Lazarus is asleep. I'm going to wake him up. Referring to death. Coming back to chapter 15 here, Paul presents a strong case for Jesus' resurrection based upon the eyewitness testimony of many, many people. Notice, if you look back in verse 3 and on to verse 8, we won't read it, but I'll just tell you what it's saying. It says, lots of people saw Jesus after he rose from the, the grave. Peter, the 12 disciples, 500 people at one time, James, the apostle, and then even Paul himself saw Jesus. Are these reliable witnesses, or do we need more? Let's think about it. Peter and Paul, are they reliable? Well, if we remember their stories, they both ended up suffering for Jesus' sake, being persecuted, thrown in prison, even killed for their faith in Jesus. Would they have done that if it was all fake, if it was all just made up? If Peter, James, and John somehow snuck into the tomb during the night when it was sealed by the guard and snuck the body of Jesus out? If that were true, would Peter have died for that whole story? It's a big fake story. I don't think so. Why would you die for something that's so fake? Some scenario that you created by your own deception. 500 people, Paul says, saw Jesus. Now, imagine a court of law. There's a court case. And somebody brings in 500 eyewitnesses to back up their case. It's going to be pretty convincing, isn't it? Pretty convincing. It's going to take a long time to hear all that testimony. But at the end of it, who can deny it? If 500 people said, we saw it, we saw him, he's not dead, he's alive. Of course, we know Jesus appeared and even allowed the Thomas, the doubting disciple. Remember, he said, I won't believe it unless I see it, unless I touch him. Jesus said, okay, I'll do that. I'll come. Look at me, Thomas. Come, touch me. See me. I'm really alive. It's not just a story. It really happened. Jesus rose from the dead. Paul is making a strong case here. With Jesus still in the grave, Paul makes the case we might as well go home and never come back to church. But Jesus is alive. With Jesus still in the grave, why bother coming to church and giving your tithes and offerings? Just keep your money and stay at home if Jesus is still dead. But Jesus is alive. With Jesus still in the grave, who cares about the Ten Commandments? Who cares about the Bible? It's just a make up, made up story. But Jesus is alive. The Bible is true. Jesus is alive. Praise the Lord. 
Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, we can find meaning and purpose in being part of a church family, a church community, and bringing in our tithes and offerings. For what purpose? To spread the gospel with the people in this world so more people can know Jesus and be saved in his kingdom. Because Jesus lives, we can obey his law and experience his peace. Because he lives, we can look forward to the resurrection of the dead and being joined together once again with our loved ones. Because he lives, we can live forevermore. Look at verse 24 down to verse 26. Then comes the end, Paul writes, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. And notice verse 26. The last enemy. Who is the last enemy? The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Because Jesus lives, we can rejoice in the fact that death itself that enemy called death will one day be destroyed. As I was thinking about this sermon, I remembered a few years ago, 2017, we had already been here in Lebanon for one year. Eva had been born in December, our little Lebanese baby, close as possible, close as can be, right? And we went to the U.S. for vacation in the summer to go reconnect with our families before we would come back here for our second year. And we were traveling in the state of Minnesota in the U.S. where two of my grandmas lived at the time. My mom's mom lived there and my dad's mom lived there. So for the first one we went to visit was my dad's mom. We call her Grandma Miller and it's Eva's great-grandma Miller and the other girl's great-grandma Miller. And that's the first time Great Grandma Miller, whose name is Eva Miller, by the way, got to meet baby Eva Miller. It was a beautiful thing. Got to see Grandma. And we were having a nice time with my grandma. And the next day we were going to see my other grandma so she could meet Eva, this new little baby in the Miller family. And while we were enjoying our afternoon with my grandma, I got a phone call probably about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, from my mom. Kind of strange, why is mom calling me right now? And she was upset on the phone, she was emotional. She says, Grandma's dead, Grandma's gone. Just like that. I said, what? Grandma's gone, I'm going to see her tomorrow. She, no, she's dead. I'm 15 minutes away driving from there. How could I not know this? How, why didn't anybody tell me she was going to be potentially dying so soon. I could have went to see her that day. I could have prayed with her. I could have seen her and talked to her before she passed away. But it happened so fast. She never got to meet little Eva. And so when the Bible calls death an enemy, I agree. It's an enemy. It steals our loved ones. It stole Minas a few months ago. It steals our loved ones, our husbands, our grandmas, our moms, our dads. It steals the ones we love. Death is an enemy. But hallelujah, the Bible says one day it's going to be destroyed. Hallelujah, death is finished. It's over with. One day. The Bible teaches the resurrection, and this gives us hope. This gives us hope of seeing our loved ones again. It's a vital teaching of Holy Scriptures. In fact, the New Testament church, when you read the book of Acts, you see that the early church faced fierce persecution, because of their belief in and their bold proclamation of the resurrection of the dead. Many examples are in the book of Acts. I just want to put one on the screen for you to see. 
Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They're upset at them for preaching the resurrection of the dead, of preaching Jesus, that he has risen from the dead. They're upset at these guys. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. And over and over we, again we see this happening. But for the early church and for the last day church today, the resurrection of the dead is vital to our belief system. It gives us hope for the future. Praise the Lord that Jesus rose from the grave, that he has power over death. Because he has power over the grave, that should affect how we live, how we handle death, even of loved ones. I remember back in, in 2003, seems like a long time ago now, I was a student missionary in Chuuk, way over there in Micronesia, close to Guam, you know, past the Philippines. And on the island, it's a small little island, you know, like probably the size of, not even as big as Beirut, the whole island. You can walk around it practically in one day. And uh, on the island, they, at, right after New Year's, there was a conflict that took place. And sometimes in conflicts, people get mad and do foolish things and unrational things because they're used, they're, they've lost their temper, they've lost their cool. There was a fight on the island. Somebody grabbed a gun and shot and killed a young man who was the other side of this fight. And this was a shock to the island because the whole time I was there, I never heard of one murder except this one. Because... It doesn't happen. It's a small community, not very many people. And so, because it was such a shock to the island, and because it happened maybe a kilometer or two from our school, our school community went to the funeral to support the family, to support the people, even though we didn't know them. Maybe the pastor did at the time, so we went anyways to support this family that was mourning this tragedy. And I remember as we walked there, as we got closer to where the, the body was and the funeral was going to be, I heard this terrible sound, this loud sound. And I saw, what is that? Get, get closer, get closer. And it gets louder and louder and louder. And as I got there, I realized what the sound was. What, what do you think it was? The sound of mourning. The sound of wailing. And I hadn't heard it like that before. This was loud, painful wailing. So sad. And to me, I remember distinctly that it, it sounded hopeless. Like the people who were crying and wailing had no hope. For the people that don't believe that Christ has power over the grave... Death is the ultimate end. And if death is the ultimate end, then I can fully understand why wailing and mourning uncontrollably, loudly, because this guy is dead and you'll never, ever, ever see him again. But as Christians, death is not the end. Jesus has power over the grave. Because he does, we can look forward to the resurrection of the saved and the destruction of death. We don't have to be afraid of death. We don't have to be hopeless. Jesus is risen. And because he is risen, his people will be raised one day soon also when Jesus comes. What a glorious day that will be. Reuniting with cousins with spouses, with friends, grandparents, parents, siblings, children, whoever you've lost that you love, who's died in Christ, you can be reunited with them. The Bible says, verse 26, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. 
Notice what Revelation 20, verse 14 says, also in your study guide, if you're following along in your study guide, Revelation 20, verse 14, that then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Ah, oh, second death. What is the second death? The second death is eternal death, a permanent death, where there will be no resurrection from that death. Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 15 that death itself will be wiped out of existence. It's the last enemy to be destroyed. And so by comparing what Paul says with what John says in Revelation, the second death is the lake of fire. The lost, the wicked, will all be burned up and completely destroyed at the, at the lake of fire, experiencing the second death. And then Paul says death itself is the last enemy that will be destroyed. So in other words, the lake of fire cannot last forever and ever. It must also come to an end because death itself is destroyed. Thus the fire will end and Satan and those with him will cease to exist. Even the next chapter in Revelation, chapter 21, verse 4, describes a bright future when it says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more what? No more death. Aren't you looking forward to that day? No more death. No more funerals. No more graveside services. No more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that day. And we all can look forward to that day because Jesus is risen. Jesus says in John 11:25, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Notice this quote from Ellen White. It's in your study guide as we get ready to close. Here's what she says. She says, His death, the death of Jesus, and resurrection are to be kept, are to be ever kept fresh in the minds of those who receive and believe in Him as their Redeemer. You know what that tells me? And we talked about this last night at Vespers for those who were here. You'll remember. If we're going to keep the resurrection of Christ fresh in our minds always, does that mean we only think about it on Easter weekend? Or this Easter weekend and next Easter weekend and then all us, we forget about the resurrection of Jesus, the death of Christ, until next year? No, no, we can't forget about it. We need to focus on it. We need to keep it ever fresh in our minds. Notice what she continues to say. The resurrection of Christ is the assurance of our salvation. He is the source of our life. Because I live, now she's quoting Jesus, ye shall live also. We have a living Savior. In this we may all rejoice. Christ is not in Joseph's new tomb, but is our friend at court, in the heavenly court, pleading in our behalf. Approach your Savior, she says, with full assurance of faith. For he ever liveth to make intercession for you. Upon him you may depend for comfort and peace. Beautiful. Let's keep the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ ever fresh in our minds. We have great hope as Christians because of what the Bible says, what the Bible teaches. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? Jesus conquered the grave. When Jesus returns, the dead will be raised. Death is not the end for the followers of Christ. Death does not have victory. Thank God for Jesus' resurrection power, for his victory over death. And so I want to 
give you just a minute to respond to this teaching from Holy Scripture. It's in your study guide, just a little appeal for you to think about this, to internalize it a little bit more. Let me go through these little boxes with you. You can fill them in privately. You're not giving them to me or anybody else. It's just for you to internalize it. First box. I believe Jesus rose from the grave as the New Testament proclaims. Do you believe that? I hope you really believe that in your heart. Number two. I believe Jesus has power over the grave, and I look forward to his second coming and the resurrection of the dead. That's our hope. That's why we're called Seventh-day Adventists, by the way. Looking forward to the advent of Christ, the resurrection of the dead. This is our great hope. Third box. I am glad that one day death will be destroyed and no longer exist. I'm checking that box for sure. I'm tired of losing grandparents. Losing previous teachers, losing friends. And I'm sad to think my parents will someday die. My other grandparents will someday die if Jesus doesn't come. But look, one day death is gone. Destroyed. Won't exist anymore. I'm looking forward to that because of Jesus and what he's done for us. The fourth box, like the early New Testament church, I too, with God's help, will boldly proclaim the resurrection of Jesus to this lost and dying world. Don't just say hallelujah, Jesus is risen, and keep it to yourself. Take the good news that you believe in your heart, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is coming soon, that he has power to give eternal life to those who believe. Share that hope with the world. Share it with this lost and dying world. I hope you believe, my friends, that Jesus is risen. He really has conquered the grave. Let's share this good news with others. Amen. I invite you to grab your hymnals now and turn them to uh, page 526, number 526, Because He Lives.
heaven. Thank you so much for Jesus, our Savior, that he lives today. The tomb is empty. And our Savior Jesus is coming back to take us to be with him one day soon. Help us to share the good news of the resurrected Christ with this world all around us here in Lebanon and wherever we go so that others can know this great truth, this great life-changing truth of the resurrected Christ and the hope we have of eternal life through what he did. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.